Hi there, and welcome to another episode of The Inevitable. This is Motor Trends podcast about the future of the car. Are they going to be electric? Are they going to be hydrogen? Are they going to even have steering wheels? Where are we going and how are we going to get there? And what are we going to eat once we get there? Yes. Uh, you'll see what that means in a second. I'm joined as always by my co-host, Mr. Ed Lowe. Um, and we have a kind of a different show today. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm super excited. I... I happen to think this will probably be the one where we uh, maybe talk the least about cars. That's because, okay. Every because, once in a while. yeah, these are subjects that are very near and dear to my heart and Johnny's. Um, alongside cars, uh, we're both sort of uh, LA uh, dorks. We kind of grew up here. We 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 love the city. We live in the city. And if you look at Ed's Instagram account, it's ninety percent food. Yes, not cars. I, I'm. I've a, <laughs> a, I'm, a, I'm an amateur cook, not nowhere near a chef. I, actually, I'm not a gourmet. I'm not a gourmand. I just like to eat stuff. Uh, just so does Johnny. I mean, and, look at uh, me. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and we happen to have two of LA's uh, biggest, best chefs, restaurateurs, uh, restaurant owners, uh, coming to visit. They also happen to be Johnny's uh, close personal friends, as I think we'll find out. Uh, and I understand you have some funny stories about Well, you yeah. Know. So we, we got Michael Samarusti and uh, Sang Yoon coming in. So Michael's famous for his restaurant Providence. Sang is famous for his restaurant, uh, restaurants, Father's Office, which is like a gastropubby kind of uh, beer location. And I, so I first heard about Sang and met him probably about 20 years ago. So mm. Father's Office, Santa Monica. Everybody knows the Culver City location. Yeah, the Santa Monica one's the OG. Is the, the OG, one, right? yeah. And so I used to be in a homebrew club. I used to brew my own beer and, and I was on the board and we had a board meeting at Father's Office and it blew me away because it was like, well, first of all, you had this beer called Pliny the Elder on tap and like just no one else had it. Right. But also like the food was delicious and the, and the beer selection at the time, there was nowhere else like it in the city of Los Angeles. Right. And... I said, I got to meet this guy. Who is this guy? And, and somebody, um, I think my friend Drew Beecham was like, oh, this guy Sang owns it. He, he's not very nice. And I'm like, well, everybody likes me. Uh, and I walk over and I, you know, I tap him on the shoulder because he was standing there. And uh, he turns around and just looks at me, just giving me the stink eye. And I'm like, hey, man, I just want to say, like, I love this place. Like, it's so cool what you're doing for the beer world. And I don't think he said anything, but he definitely just didn't really – have a reaction and just turned his back and kept talking. It's just nothing. Like, cool. And I didn't even say that. And I'd never like met an owner of anywhere that treated anyone like that. So I was like, what a jerk, right? right. So fast forward many years, he doesn't obviously, he obviously doesn't remember me, right. I should say. I get a, a, a DM on Instagram from Chef Sang Yoon. And he's like, hey, I have an idea about cars and food I want to talk to you about. And I'm like, man, I really hate this guy. So I actually asked Michael. I'm like, what, what's he really like? You know, <laughs> Michael Samarusti. Michael Samarusti is our other guest. And Michael was, uh, I'm not going to tell you what he said, but he was like, you know, approach with caution. And uh, anyways, Sang and I, we met, I, you know, I told him that story and he laughed and we hit it off. And we're, we're really good friends now. Um, and then Michael, the story I think is even a little bit funnier. And uh, uh, there was a barbecue at my friend's house. And I had this friend Mia who was attending and she was like cooking a pork loin or something like that. And she's, and she's, she's a very good home cook, like re really incredible right. actually. Pickles her own vegetables, like everything, you know, ferments everything. And she's really nervous about this pork loin, you right. know? And I'm like, yeah, okay. And she's going the whole, she's like, just tell me how it is. You gotta let me know. So, you know, food served, we eat it. And uh, she's like, what'd you think of the pork loin? I'm like, oh, it's great. You know, it's, Mia, it's really good. But man, this this halibut, like, who made this halibut? She's like, ah, oh, yeah, effing Michael made the halibut. And I like walk up to him. And again, I'm such a schmuck. I walk up to him. I'm like, hey, dude, bro, I had no idea who he was. Uh, you know, I go, listen, I eat a lot of food. I don't travel the I'm world. I'm kind of a big deal. I'm kind of a big deal. And like, and like this this halibut. I mean, this is terrific. Yes, and, you and should, everyone, and you should like, get to this professionally. Yeah, and everyone's like, Johnny, that's Michael Samarusti. He's, he's, he's got a Michelin star. Yeah. You know, and I just felt like a real schmuck. And, and and then I realized he owned Providence. I just didn't, it was just, you know. And now he has two Michelin stars. Now he has two. He's improved. Uh, yeah. There's only three you can get. <laughs> and and the third one's really more for like uh, having flashy, crazy service, service. not so yeah. much quality of the food. Yeah. And there's very few Michelin starred restaurants in Los Angeles. It's, there's almost none it's with It's kind two. of a black eye for LA. Like nope. every year the Michelin Michelin Guide comes out and they talk about how, oh, France is like blown up again, a resurgence, or New yeah. York, and then Japan is like the latest hotspot. Well, you know, for years they stopped giving right. LA uh, stars at snobs. all. Yeah, yeah, they're really snobby. But, you know, Michelin, and it's named after the, the tire. Michelin Tire it, Guide. There, there is a, a tie in. Yeah, it started as a way to uh, ostensibly sell more tires, encourage more road trips. And if you're going on a road trip, this is again like 1900s, 1800s, 1900s? 1900s. 1900s. Yeah, yeah. 
pre-internet, in the right? 20s, pre-newspaper. Yeah, I think it was the 20s. Pre like not pre-newspaper, but pre like travel section in your newspaper and like the 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 first road guide to tell you where you where you should eat, where you should stay. But why this is an LA story is that yes, Michelin is world renowned, blah blah blah. These guys uh Michael Samrusti and Sang Yoon and their respective restaurants have also made what I consider, and for I used to read religiously, was the top guide for Los Angeles restaurants, which is the LA Times top 100 guy by their food critic, the late Jonathan Gold, who yeah. is uh, somewhat of an idol of mine. It got me into really interested in food. Uh, you know, I moved here in the late, in the mid 90s to go to college. And I had read, I used to read the LA Times for the sports section, and increasingly a column called Counterintelligence, which covered all the best food spots. And, uh, and I came and I went to USC. I went to try to hit all of these ones I could afford. Uh, a lot of the old, old-timey old stuff, like Musso and Frank's or Formosa or some of the like the establishment joints, uh, a lot of the restaurants these guys worked at, they were like, were way out of my price range because it was like the 90s and the two, early 2000s, like Spago's. Yeah, yeah. And, the, you know, Wolfgang, all of Wolfgang Puck's joints yeah. out here, you know, which, you know, he made famous. Uh, all These guys all work in that universe, which is going to be really interesting to talk yeah, about. Yeah, and, and we'll get into how important Jonathan uh, Gold is and was to Los Angeles. But, um, you know, it's... It's 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 gonna be a funny one because again I'm, I'm I'm good buddies with these guys so yes. I'm, I'm hoping it's not too many inside jokes and I hope I get a word in edgewise <laughs> and uh, and then we're gonna try to tie it back to cars because both and that's we should have said this probably about five minutes earlier they're both huge car nerds yeah uh, really into uh, vehicles for different reasons and uh, we'll see how it goes all right let's get them in. All right, so pleasure to have both Sang and Michael here, two celebrity L.A. chefs. Between the two of you, you have two Michelin stars. Of course, Michael has both of them. Uh, <laughs> see, that, that, see this is, when he said this, I was like, this is going to be really awkward in the room. Uh, I've been sitting on that for weeks. Yeah, Come on. <laughs> that was really good. That was that's, that's harsh. Look. I'm a. You guys are chefs. You guys are friends. I'm I know. Glad it's on video because the faces are crazy. That's that's rough. Now, for, again, for the folks who, the folks who tuned in for a for an automotive podcast, like let's just we'll just give them a Michelin is like this really big deal. Michelin uh, Michelin guy. They give stars for top restaurants. I will also qualify that saying has a, he's in the guide. Uh, he's a Michelin. Um, Adjacent. Uh, for, for, <laughs> I have Michelin tires. <laughs> Four of them. Uh, he's Bib, yes. Bib Gourmand for Father's Office, as, as I understand it. Mm-hmm. And, yes. uh, and and very finely reviewed for Lakshan as well. No, Michael's, look, a, Michael's I always... a lot older than I am. <laughs> right. Mine's, <laughs> mine's older. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, That's a way more, ex- way more experience. But let me back this up. Well, so, yeah, let me, I'm just oh, okay. really young. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> let me let me back it up by saying Michelin is fine, and I want you to want to come back to the automotive tie in there. But the thing that makes me really excited to talk to you guys both is that, and again, we 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 will have prepped this in the in the introduction. It's kind of an LA story, a love story. You guys are both like super highly rated by the late Jonathan Gold, who was like a hero of mine. You had you were number one ranked in his in his annual top one hundred. List, I think the, either the last or second to last publishing, and then and you that's had, that's uh, Providence, Michael's right. Providence, yeah. uh, uh, Providence in Los Angeles, and uh, Luxshine was number three. Yeah. Well, the, yeah. so well, like, but real quick, the last one, despite being so young, yeah, right. Well, <laughs> the the, la, the last the last one Jonathan wrote, you you Michael Providence got after four years at number one got bumped down to two. Yeah. And and, and Luke Shaw was number three, but I remember reading it, and he basically said if Sang wasn't so lazy and had like a tasting menu, he could be a little higher on this list at oh. number three. So. Like that's that's, and again, if you're not an Angelino, you don't right. understand the, the 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 power of of like Jonathan you know, Gold. Jonathan Gold. Jonathan, was, I read Jonathan Gold when he had a when his column was Counterintelligence. He introduced me to so many restaurants. The one, I mean, twenty over twenty years ago, he wrote about a uh, Vietnamese a Golden Deli, a Vietnamese joint out in San Marino, and that was like my first experience with like real Vietnamese food. And forevermore, I was like, I'm reading this dude. Like, yeah. and uh, and then his top one hundred list. Was like it was like the best thing if you live in LA. Like this is this yeah. is where you find all the great eats. It was the so, Bible. Um, He's also the first journalist that like gave the same um, weight or gravity to uh, you know like mom and pop places in a strip mm-hmm. mall and exactly. fine dining restaurants. Like he didn't differentiate. It was about intent and the quality of the cuisine and quality of the experience. Exactly. I, re- I remember uh, when I bought he had a book Counterintelligence out for it was just a collection of of, of his, his writings. Of his writings. Yep. But I remember you know when I moved back from New York to LA I bought it. 
and you know he had Tommy's in there mm-hmm. as you know what I mean. And he said he said like I don't, I'll never forget. He said you know on a certain level a Tommy's cheeseburger is as satisfying as a great steak. And I was like he's right. And I and again you read the New York Times food critics. I mean they were you know very nose in the air type of thing. And, and this guy was like down to earth. And then. You learn about him. It's like, yeah, he took the bus to UCLA every day down Pico and just got off and ate his way down, like, probably the greatest food street in the world, mm. you know, so. Pretty. But the whole, the whole rest of the, I think the whole rest of the food media world has now turned to Jonathan's sort of um, ideas about what food reviewing, food reviewing should be, right. as evidenced by the fact that the New York Times just gave a three-star review to a food truck that serves Puerto Rican <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, roasted pork. Right, 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 right. So, yeah. I mean, that never would have happened without Jonathan Gold. Right. right and right. and both of you guys were very close with him. Pretty close. Pretty, yeah. like, I mean, this, he, like this close. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you were, I, mean, I remember you told me uh, about the gold cart uh, that never happened, but that was supposed to happen at Lowry's. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, could, yeah. Could that, you... that was, uh, you know, soon before he passed. Yeah, yeah. That was the uh, Lowry's 80th anniversary uh, that, you know, Nancy, John, and Vinny, and I, you know, were there and cooked and... Um, that Nancy was Silverton. That was a, literally yeah. like three months before he passed, and they were going to do this uh, cart, this this golden prime rib cart with, uh, and they were going to partner every month with a new chef. You're there too, uh, and uh, it was going to be a, a celebration of local chefs, um, you know, in the oldest prime rib joint in in LA. And, and, and if you don't know, Lowry's they're famous for having this enormous uh, stainless steel. Yeah. Aluminum. Silver. 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 It's yeah. a big silver cart, and they grandly push it to your table, and they reveal what whatever prime choice meat you Jim have. Jim Diamond and cut. Then, and then yeah. uh, carve it in front of you and serve <laughs> oh, it. Oh, yeah. So along with a salad, a spinning but, but salad. But the idea was a gold cart. Like you would reimagine, for right. lack of a better word, like uh, cream spinach, right, or something like that. Like every chef would you, – you, the prime rib would stay the same, but you would change the accoutrement. Yeah. Also, Jonathan, I think not like not a lot of people know about it, but there's an incredible podcast that um, This American Life has, uh-huh. um, and they do they do every year for Thanksgiving the Turkey Slam, and there's an incredible one that Jonathan Gold is a part of, and I don't want to give out any other information. I just encourage <laughs> everybody that thinks they know Jonathan Gold to listen to that podcast. Okay. Yeah, he is revered, but also he's he's quite the personality. He's got he's got a, a an incredible edge, history, an, an edge uh, to him as well. Oh, punk! Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. crazy punk, a yeah. classically performance trained artist, musician, performance, performance artist, artist. Mm-hmm. Yeah. and like yeah. the, I mean, he he really did just love to eat though. Because I remember I don't even ask how it happened, but I, I judged like a pork contest with him one time, and we had sixty courses of pork. I mean, it was it was ludicrous, and uh, and Jake was actually there, mm-hmm. a friend of me and Michael's, uh, but. <laughs> Afterwards, the the, the the waiters are walking by with like serving trays of bacon, and I couldn't even breathe. Right, and Jonathan reaches his hand in, grabs a handful of bacon, shoves it in his mouth, and I, I'm staring at him in disbelief. And he's like, "Thank God for Lipitor," you know. Like, <laughs> so might be was, a reason why he's you know, no, he died. He had cancer, <laughs> pancreatic cancer. Yeah, pancreatic yeah. cancer. Yeah. cancer. Right. Mm. One of my favorite things about Jonathan, too, is like every time you talk to him, he had this ability to stretch like single um, syllable words into like three syllable words or four <laughs> syllable words. Like he was famous for saying like, and like that was always part of his speech pattern. I, I think he was just kind of thinking of the next word to say, but he always did that. And it was always something that, um, that uh, you know, struck me whenever I spoke to him. And, he, you know, incredibly, incredible talent, incredible mind, mm-hmm. great writer. And in, like uh, just an unbelievable um, ability to appreciate food and wine and art of all forms, right. and I think that's what made him great. And what you know, it's the reason that he's the only person that ever won a Pulitzer Prize for criticism. Right yeah. for food critics, yeah. he was a for unique yeah. voice. Period. Right. Right. Yeah. Wow. So look, this is this is definitely turning out what I thought it'd be, which is a conversation about um, all things uh, related to LA and food. Two of my favorite topics, but we need to circle back into cars. But I want to do it kind of in a, a weird way, uh, which is to talk about. And I, I apologize because you guys are both um, you've been interviewed a lot. I've noticed a lot of like uh, you guys have a lot of. I'm going to ask you probably a lot of questions you've heard uh, before. And I should mention Ed usually does really creepy like opposition research on our guests, but he kind it's of been, ran, it's, ran out of time. Ran, it's been a busy week, so I didn't. I didn't. Well, and you guys, it's hard to find the car stuff. There was only it only came up like in in in, uh, in little drips and drabs here here and there in terms of your interest. But um, so we go back kind of the beginning. Uh, I guess I'll start with um, with saying you you grew up. In LA, right? You're you you came here. You were, I don't. I, this I didn't get. Are you born here? No. 
I was born in Seoul, Korea, okay. and my family immigrated when I was uh, one. Okay. And then my first year of life was a, um, a slow-moving uh, uh, eventual landing in, in America. Um, but as a baby, I was taken you know, through Europe and even to the Middle East. And uh, through some weird connection, my father knew the, the Shah of Iran, and we actually stayed <laughs> really? there for a little bit. Yeah. Wow. So, um, <laughs> yeah. He, had, he had great taste in cars. Many other problems. <laughs> great taste in cars. So typical immigrant experience. Right? <laughs> <laughs> very classic. Very classic. But you ended up in L.A. Yeah, we, you know, we stayed in New York for a little bit. But then, yes, eventually we uh, – my, my dad uh, was a newspaper publisher and uh, was – he wanted to bring the the Korean newspaper uh, to the uh, where the largest Korean population outside of Korea lives, sure. which is Los Angeles, and Korea town. So that's why we settled here. So I I grew up here. I'm like in in Korea town. Uh, no, I never actually lived in Korea town. Maybe except for the first couple months. But uh, no, I grew up on the west side. I'm a Santa Monica Brentwood kid. Okay, all right, fancy. Uh, and then um... I'm also 23. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's just really in dog years. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and Michael, you're Extremely you're calm. back east. Mm-hmm. You were wh- like uh, New York, Jersey, Jersey, yeah, Jersey, Jersey. New Jersey. And, and, um, and you, but you did a lot on in. I got a little bit more of your background in terms of um, getting into the cooking business. Mm-hmm. That, was, that was sort of like a. I think your first job was at a family friend's restaurant. Is that yeah. right? And mm-hmm. uh, do dishwasher. Yeah, dishwasher. And. But then eventually, for CIA training. Yeah, CIA training. Yeah. Like, what motivated you to, to get to get into the business? Yeah. Um, I just kind of felt like it, it was food was always super important in my life, and you know, I grew up in an Italian family, and um, you know, so it, it was the kind of I mean, it's you know the thing you think about when you think of like an Italian American family, like you know, Sunday meals are four or five hours long, and they start with you know, uh, whatever, a bunch of different antipasto and then a roast and then pasta and then fruit and then the poker is played, you know? And right. <laughs> like that was pretty much every Sunday. And okay. whether it was in New Jersey, whether we were in, you know, Queens, New York or Yonkers where my family was from. And, um, you know, and all that, all that experience is like really kind of left a mark on me. And when it came time to do something with my life, I just gravitated towards food. Okay. And, then how and about- I think for those reasons, yeah. Okay. I want to get back to the reason because I have a theory. But how about you saying, when did the food part Come in. Well, I was a latchkey kid. I was left alone a lot. I'm actually an only child, and uh, but because my parents both worked overseas, my mom was in fashion. She worked a lot in Europe, and my dad worked a lot in Asia. I got taken around, and I was uh-huh. exposed as a little kid to a lot of very adult fine dining experiences. And I think it left a mark on me. I, I really, you know, maybe I didn't fully understand it because I was so young even younger than I am now, but right. it's um, <laughs> hard to imagine, I know. Uh, but you're I, really I, sticking with this bit. No, really, yeah. <laughs> okay. no, that's just, you said be yourself. So um, <laughs> no, I, I, I got a, I got a really uh, interesting look at what dining was. I didn't understand it, but I knew I liked it, and I knew that I wanted to be part of it. And okay. when I was a little kid, I kind of thought I wanted to be a chemist, and I had kind of this like sort of scientific proclivities, but. I thought, man, the the the, the cooking, the entertaining, the, it's like throwing a party every night, um, watching people enjoy something that you were part of, that you crafted. I think it's, it was like a calling for me. I just think the, the the career path chose me. I don't think I had much to do with it. You you didn't have any. Um, did you have stereotypical? I mean, so far it's not stereotypical Asian, right? Like you know, Europe and, and fancy stuff. Did you have pressure to? be a chemist or pre-med or anything like that? Or are they just like, <laughs> do whatever you want? Ed had all that pressure. Right, I'm just... Ed's by far, the, like, we've talked about this a lot, but the, the biggest disappointment in the history of his family. Right, exactly. Oh, right. not no, a doctor. No, I, no I'm, I'm a huge disappointment, too. Yeah. You know, to, you know, mostly... <laughs> yes, yes. To mostly to me. <laughs> <laughs> right, no, no, it, it, it was there. The pressure was there. But I think I, the weird thing is I had two parents that were highly career, you know, like, I didn't have like a stay-at-home parent. Right. So um, they were so busy. I just, <laughs> just kind of like, I think I fell through the cracks. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it really, yeah, but no, there was pressure. You know, school, this, that. Um, I wanted to play hockey uh, growing up, and you know, there was some fighting about that and whether or not that was a worthy. You know, like why would you go to this school? Well, because they have a really good hockey team, and so yeah, there was some definitely some Asian pressure there. Tiger mom action. Okay. Happening. So now this is a, ostensibly <clears throat> an, a car, an automotive podcast. So like, where does the where do the cars, <laughs> where does the passion for cars come in? We're going to get to what you guys like, but like, we're talking about your earlier years, Michael. What what um, 
What were, you, what were your influences out there in Jersey in an Italian family? Uh, auto, uh, Besides big, Camaros. Yeah. Camaros. Yeah, a lot of Camaros. Trans Ams and you know, fire chickens on the hood and stuff like that. I'm, well, I mean, I think it really started when I was a kid. Um, well, I used to always go to car shows with my father because my father was really into cars from the 50s. And then eventually, I think I was in eighth grade, he bought a 1956 Lincoln Continental Mark II. Oh. And it hey, real, was, real quick, so just if anyone listening, like the Mark II is sort of the best thing Lincoln's ever done after World War II. Like they're, yeah. they're literally incredible. Like the attention to detail they would leave the factory with all the bolts turned in the same direction so if you looked at like the you know the phillips head screws they're all making a perfect 45 degree x yeah. every single bolt on the car yeah and they never all did anything. Yeah. yeah it was an incredible car but he you know bought it at, somewhere up in connecticut i remember i drove on the front seat back with him from new from connecticut to new jersey and uh and then he just proceeded to like tear it apart piece by piece and put it in like uh you know plastic bags and whatever he had, everything labeled. And he had zero mechanical ability because he's a <laughs> chemist. My father was a chemist. Oh, okay. Um, oh, so it's zero mechanical ability, but a very analytical mind. And he got, you know, blow ups from the factory, um, you know, whatever the factory I'm sorry, uh, he's literature. Taking, he was taking it apart. Why? To restore it. So he tore it all the way down to oh, just a rolling well, chassis got it. Okay. in the garage, okay. in our garage, piece by piece. And, and then, you know, slowly, all the while, assembling new parts that he needed from Hemmings Motor News. And then um, eventually, over the course of like 30 years, sent it off to different shops all around the country to get it to the point where it was perfect. This like, was... He took it as far as he could, and then he sent it off and, and had it absolutely perfected. And it was a 100-point car. Wow. Um, like, you know, that was showed all over the country. And then eventually, at a certain point, he got sick of it and sold it. I don't know. He just didn't. I don't know. What do you? What do you? Around like what year was this? I'm trying to do the math. I, right. like, I mean, I'm 23, like saying. So, <laughs> no. No. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I was a kid. I was like, you know, early teens, all through. Um, you know, I mean, it, the car was not complete until I was in my 40s. So how, that's how long it took. How me. rough? So how rough was the car when you got it? Not that bad. It was in drivable condition. We drove it from Connecticut to New Jersey. Okay, it's it was a, fine. It's just he tore it apart and made it absolutely perfect. And so when you said because when you when you first said you were going to car shows, I was, trying, I was going to ask you what car shows were you going to with your dad? Were these like well, there's a, like a, I live like hot rod cool. shows or like 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 no classic New York classic, oh, classic shows. Okay, got it. Classic shows. Okay, we would go to classic shows all the time. Uh, wherever there was one within a drivable distance, we would go. And then I like as a kid, like my mom had a 944 Turbo. I had a 914. Uh, 2.0, 1974. The thing was awesome, like just amazing. Not that a, was my car when I chemist? was in high school. So, like, what's the, what's the, what, does, what, does, what kind of chemicals is your dad? <laughs> he <laughs> worked for a big pharmaceutical company. Uh, like, you know, right. okay. he did okay. Very yeah. cool. Yeah. Okay. And saying your uh, automotive passion started after hockey, alongside hockey? I grew up in L.A., so cars are, you know, we're a car society. And uh, I think, you know, I was... I had every poster. I had the Countach poster. I had the 930 slant nose. Do you have the Dream Garage poster with uh, with uh, the <laughs> Testarossa, the Lamborghini? I think the I had Testarossa. Decisions, decisions, yeah. decisions. Yeah. Decisions. Yeah. Decisions. Yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. Chicken the bikini. I still have. No, I have the one with all three of them framed still. So it was like a red, red Testarossa, white 930. It's some slant sort of like Spanish, black... like Spanish weird garage. Like, oh, you're that's... conflating them. Yeah, yeah. No, that's I don't that. Know. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. All right, sorry. Keep going. Yeah, yeah I, I had all the you know the the. the the G wagon before you can get one in America. That was sort of a you know, you know, um, you know, interested in that. And um, and we got to high school. Uh, I got in a fight with my mom, which I did a lot. Um, she wanted me to have a very large safe car hmm. as my first car, uh, preferably a Volvo station wagon. Good. Um, and I said no, <laughs> I don't want that. So we compromised, and I got an IROC Z28. Ah. Right. <laughs> which is the size of a large <laughs> Volvo station wagon, but it only had two doors. Right, right, right. right. So, yeah. um, totally unsafe. Yeah. Right. So I had How's a, that a compromise? That's just, you win. <laughs> you win. Right. Well, well, I actually sh- showed her the dimensions. I said, if you ah, park this, it's the okay. same size. Yes, ah. but it's made, so, of, it's made of old pizza boxes. <laughs> her, her idea was that the larger Mass. the vehicle, yeah. Physics. the safer right. you no, are. Oh, in there's it. there's yeah. some some right. truth to that. Right. Unless just, they fold. It's very simple. Yes. <laughs> Unless it's made in Van Nuys. Right. Which it right. Was, by, yes. by drunken right. That's what I've uh, heard animals. From people. It, I don't it, know. It, 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 yeah. In fact, uh, that era of um, of uh, Camaro and Trans Am, they would lose 200 cars a year to drunk driving. Literally, the guys driving them off the line into the parking lot to, for storage, they'd lose 200 cars a year. It shows you the quality of the workmanship. There were there were multiple reports of um, uh, irate union workers like putting um, 
like intentionally mis- misassembling the oh, vehicles, yeah, yeah, like putting parts in the oh, wrong I place. Had, I had a, um, like just rattles in the door. Yeah, for some so reason. I had a rattle in the door. <laughs> actually, <laughs> beer can, enough. beer can. No, it was um. So we opened the door panel, and uh, there was a socket wrench. Yeah, yeah. yeah. left yeah. in the door. Oh yeah, yeah. And I thought it's like those uh, stories you hear about surgery Surgeons. with yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the tools in the guy. It's like no, it's the same thing. But right. your, your dad also had uh, a classic car. Dad had a, a 66 E-Type. Yeah. Yeah. And Whoa. it was sort of the uh, his version of the Ferris Bueller 250 <laughs> GT, but it wasn't a 250. It was just a Jag. But you weren't allowed to look at it? I no, think. I wasn't allowed to. Yeah. <laughs> never, like my, never drove it? No. My grubby hands were never allowed to go in there. <laughs> it was wet, rubbed with a diaper. and yeah. I had the same thing. My dad bought a uh, 911 Turbo, and uh, I had, by the, when he got it, uh, I already had three tickets and one accident on my record, and was kicked off the company, the family insurance policy. So he made me sign a release saying I would never drive it. Uh, wow. But now it's yours. Well, now I have it. Yeah. So he gave uh, it to he gave, well, yeah. well, I bought him a car, and he, he yeah. traded. But right. uh, it, was, it was a good deal. What so, year is it? It's an '87, '87 911 Turbo, and uh, yeah, it's. Uh, that's a good car. It's hilarious. Yeah. Oh, his yeah. car's cool. Yeah, yeah super white, cool. Yeah. white with white. Blo- with uh, classic blo- uh, gar- guards red interior. Mm. Yeah. Red interior. Red interior. Guards red inside. That's, white that's, wheels and a white on the outside. Oh, that's so 80s. It it's is. so 80s. Oh yes, God. yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. It's, uh, it's, uh, I wanted the white slant nose 930. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. With the louvered fender. Yep. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that was a That was the one. classic color for Yes. Me. And there was, and that's the thing, because I, I grew up in L.A. too, and we would, my dad's best friend lived in Orange County, so we'd always meet, like, in Beverly Hills for, like, breakfast or dinner or whatever, and, like... In the 80s, I mean, the number of slant noses was crazy. It was, they were everywhere, right. you know? And, uh, yeah, have big fun. As I've heard of cars. the 80s. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's, that's yeah, when you were really. after college for yeah, you. Yeah, no, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so both of you guys end up getting into, prof- into um, the, the, the restaurant business. This is, I'm accelerating way past because you did a lot of your training uh, back east, right, in mm-hmm. New York. You both actually have um, – Hard, I mean, I guess everybody does, right? Everyone does and does a tour of like French working in French restaurants, like in 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 either in Europe or like a place like New York City. Mm-hmm. Um, you went again. I got kind of so say Michael. Remember. Michael did. Yeah, yeah. You did a Podcast. stint at Le Cirque. Mm-hmm. You came to LA. You worked at uh, a couple of the most iconic restaurants here: Water Grill and uh, Spago's. Yeah, the original one. The original one, which was wild, and then saying in after the 80s. in the eighties, <laughs> <laughs> saying two thousands. Thank you very much. Eight or nine? Yeah. yeah. What year was that? Saying when you did you did stints. I don't know where you worked in in Europe, uh, uh, but is Paris there, and Monaco. Anything anything notable that anybody listening might even might have heard of in terms of uh, like the restaurant? Yes. Oh yeah, there were. Yeah, I didn't. I, mean, I didn't go there to work. <laughs> no, no, I didn't, I didn't mean that. The McDonald's on the shelf yeah, still yeah, is saying yeah, no. very. very <laughs> Yeah, no, I worked uh, – my first job in Europe was uh, Robichon. So, oh, yeah, okay. So that's, I got, that's pretty I got a, low key. Um, yeah. No, but, you know, no one who worked there got, you know, like paid uh, Oh, I assume you didn't make any money. No, 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 that's no, no, pretty, no, no, no. It wasn't You profitable. do it for the right. – uh, being right. able to say so, yeah, Robichon. You, yeah. You're a commie. You're, you're just a, you know, a, a personal <laughs> slave to someone who does get paid. Right. Yeah. And uh, – but it was a hell of an experience. And then I got a paying job afterwards uh, when I worked for uh, Ducasse at uh, Tildebury oh, in Monaco. Crap. Yeah. Okay. So that was, so I did Holy. two, three stars in a row. Holy and moly. that was sort of the indoctrination. Um, I, unlike Michael, did not finish culinary school. I started, I tried it. Um, Which one? Uh, CIA. CIA? Uh, okay. I would say it was a mutual parting of the ways. <laughs> Interesting. Um, <laughs> what would they say? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. They may have seen it differently. <laughs> CIA is Culinary did Institute they, of America. It's did like they invite the you one. back to uh, for a graduation ceremony? No, no, they didn't. Um, but, but, <laughs> Honorary degree? No, but it, strangely, um, they did. They did invite me to a. Uh, um, uh, what was it? A uh, an alumni event. Interesting. Yeah, and they asked me to host an alumni event, and I said, "You may want to check the records." <laughs> <laughs> how many? How long? How long were you there? How long had you been? Um, how, how many years or whatever no, semesters? No, 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 no. Oh. It, it, it was like it was like three months. Interesting. Yeah, it yeah, is. Yeah. It's a. It's a. I mean, it's probably works really well for some people, but it's not. Not me. Oh. It's not the greatest. Uh, but you waited for me. I mean, I I did graduate, but like you know. Well, you're likable. No. <laughs> 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 Why? Thank you, Sam. <laughs> well, just let's just say it. Um, but it's a, it's a you know it, there's a there's let's just say there's plenty of great experience to be had in the real world. Hmm. You know what I mean? But and do you guys hire out? Of, you guys hire out of CIA now? I, I take externs because I I kind of feel like 
like for me when I went on our like externship is part Sang wouldn't know this because he only made it three months but like <laughs> part of the curriculum is a, <laughs> part of the curriculum is an externship where you go out and you work in a restaurant in the real world and if you're really you know thinking about what you're doing and you don't just want to go to Miami Beach mm-hmm. like but wait a minute now there are good restaurants in Miami so I shouldn't say that I right? mean I, I, was, I, I was just there I'm not so sure that's yeah, true no but, it's true go it's ahead. True. but anyway <laughs> um, where in Miami uh, we'll go through it after but um, you know you go to a place that like where you're going to learn something, you know what I mean? And it, for me, the world really opened up when I did that. And okay. so I kind of feel like it's my responsibility now to like, give people the opportunity to have that same experience that I had, where, you know, suddenly you, you know, because the CIA experience, let's face it, can be very stifling, right? I thought so. Yeah, but, so, but you get out in the real world and you see how, the, you know, good aspirational kitchens are run, you, you know, mm. you really start to learn something. And, you know, and that's what happened for me. And that's why I want to give that same experience to other people. So you did you do an externship? Absolutely. Oh, okay. Yeah, in New York. Okay. In New York City. Okay. So then uh, then I got to go back and say you did 3 months at CIA and then how do you end up at Joel Rubichon and Alain Ducasse's restaurants in France? It was France. suggested what? that I leave. <laughs> um, that I pursue a different path to yeah. this ultimate career. Um, what ultimately what I what it, you know, I what I was having problems with was the was the pace of learning. I thought it was just I got bored. Yeah. And I'm kind of ADD. I just, I, I, I didn't need, I don't know. It's, I think it's like Michael said, I think some people really, sure. you know, uh, flourish in that environment. I just don't think it was the right match. I think it was the right call. Um, if I had to do it all, all over again, I probably would have done the same thing. Hmm. Um, I had, um, uh, a family friend, uh, they had a, a son, a couple years older than me, went to high school together. He went, um, to CIA and graduated hmm. and then, had a very, I don't know, what you'd call a more traditional career. He went to go work for a hotel company, worked there for 20 years, you know, was like a banquet chef. And, you know, he worked his way up, you know, where I took him, uh, what would you call a much riskier path. Right. Uh, you're not getting paid. Uh, you don't know where you're going to end up. You don't know if you'll make it even six months. Um, and did you speak French when you went? Very to- little. Very little. Very little. Un petit peu, as yeah. I say. <laughs> yeah. So there was that. There was a language barrier. Um, I didn't know where I was going to live. So there was a whole bunch of challenges that you just throw yourself into. But you're 19, and you know you just yeah. figure it out. Yeah, so right, right. if there was ever a time to take a risk like that, that was probably the, you know. So you got to really make a decision. I think if you want to get into this career, and you're like, well, what path is right? Um, fortunately or unfortunately, the kinds of opportunities that were afforded me when I was you know that age three years ago. Um, right. <laughs> um, it was three years ago. Right. Yeah. So yeah. Um, dedication no, but, to no, the bit. The, but the the labor laws and things have changed. Um, <laughs> you, know, you can't beat people. Right. Try to light them on fire. You you. There's a lot of things that you don't do anymore. So, so that was that was big in Paris. Was the, the beating? Well, it was <laughs> it was a different time. Um, Did you have knives thrown at you? I've heard about like no, pot, no, pots and pans no, or nothing, cooking no, cooking up no, no, no. no. I mean, okay. there's obviously some people may have, but no, I didn't experience that. I've, I watch other people get <laughs> abused. Um, okay. I know I've seen some things that were a little bit physical, but um, I would say it's a more of an emotionally abusive uh, circumstance. There's a lot of yelling. There's a lot of, um, you know, kind of boot campy okay. stuff. Um, and I, I, I get it. I just don't think that, you know, and as time passes, I don't think people, young people today may want that kind of experience because sure. it's, you know, the learning is different. You can learn differently now. Learning in many ways is easier. So I don't know if that environment is relevant anymore. You know, I always think about it because, like, that's what I went through. And I think you're just a, you know, you're just a soft millennial. You don't know. <laughs> and, right, 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 right. So, you know, so I always, you know, but. Well, you're a soft millennial. Right, exactly. <laughs> oh, really? No, 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 he's Gen Z. He's no. Gen Z. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but so ultimately you ended up at Michael's and... Uh, Not this Michael. Right. No, sorry, saying yeah. you ulti- ulti- <laughs> Michael's, you, uh, Michael's yeah. and... Um, it's a restaurant. It's a very famous... Chinois. And uh, mm-hmm. both of these are also famous. I, I noted at Michael's, you were... Uh, Nancy Silverstone also. Did she work there at the same time or came through? No, no, Nancy's much older than me. Uh, <laughs> I love wow. Yeah. Wow. Much, much, yeah. Way, yeah. No, no, no. She's more of a mother figure. Um, no, uh, no, we didn't work there at the same time. Uh, I worked there. Um, when did I work there now? Uh, before Father's Office. So it, was, it would have been the late 90s. Okay. Um, he was in utero. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, We're actually, not before, even conceived. No, no yeah. it wasn't. Conceived. Yeah. yeah. That's true. It is almost I 2023. Before I was born. Yeah. Yes. But, um, it was around the time like Walter Mansky was chef at Patina, you know, it was, you know, the time, you know, the, you know, and, you know, we're 
that generation of chef now, like, you know, um, you know, a lot of guys have, you know, several restaurants and we've been around a while, but that was a, that was an interesting time in food. It was like right for the millennium change and, um, you know, the, like Suzanne Cohen had only had Luke for, you know, like a year or two. It was a, it was an interesting time in food. And I think a lot of the, the, the chefs that are, you know, been around a while, better known today. I think, you know, that was the, those are the times you kind of had your first. That was the breeding yeah, ground. Yeah, like this first, your, this is kind of like your first chef job, your first time you're in charge. You're like, you're in your late twenties and, you know, you're kind of developing who you are as a chef. And of. was that before or after you left New York? Because I know after you, you well, worked there. Well, it was in LA, so it would have been. Oh, no, it was after. I only worked in New York uh, when I was a, a teenager. I was going to ask why. No, 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 for real. Hmm? <laughs> the real time. No, didn't you, didn't you, you were in L.A. and then you went to go to New York for a little bit? Oh, I worked at the Michaels in New York. Yeah, the Michaels yeah. in New York. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that oh, was so same, so, okay, yeah, Because we had two restaurants. So. Right, right, right. I was going to ask why, because you, you were talking a little bit about why were you, why did you guys both want to open restaurants or, or work in Los Angeles? Because, I mean, the... I think prior to your arrival, those it was Wolfgang Puck was kind of like the big thing, and a couple other guys you mentioned. But New York was still like like the like the the spot, right? And mm-hmm. had been like why why come west, especially well, for you because you're because you're because you're an East Coast guy. Well, I mean, I'd recently been married. My wife and I we actually left New York for a while, moved to Paris, worked there for a while, and then um, you know came back, and I was running a restaurant in New York, and then you know we just kind of decided that, you know, we wanted to raise a family and have kids and that kind of thing and and just felt like the better, you know, that L.A. might afford us a better sort of like uh, opportunity to, to do that, hmm. you know. And so, you know, I applied to a bunch of places out here. Uh, like all the – at that time it was like early – it was early 2000s and – or no, no, sorry, late 90s. And I guess so I applied to all the places you might think. Like, what was your first L.A. job? Uh, Spaco. Oh, okay. So I applied with Wolfgang. Pretty good job. uh, Alice Waters. (laughs) (laughs) So both of you guys have worked for Wolfgang Puck, right? Yes, we have. I only worked there for like a year at the original Spago because I I mean, like when I worked in France, we were working like literally like 90 to 100 hour weeks. And then I came here and, you know, started working for Wolf and it was about the same. Like it was insane. I mean, it was crazy. Wolf doesn't take days off. And, um, you know, it was a different world back then, as Sang said. Um, so that that was, you know, it was trying. I mean, in New York, I worked a lot, too. When I was at the Cirque, I mean, it was a six-day work week, and we worked at a minimum, like, 13, 14 hours a day. You go in at what time? Uh, we'd go in around, like, you. basically, you didn't have an in time. You didn't have an out time. I never clocked in. None of that. It was just... None of that stuff. That's right. It was, uh, <laughs> Your paycheck's you know, at eight hours, though. Yeah. But literally, <laughs> like, time. it was just, yeah. you know, if you had the responsibility to get your station prepared, and whatever time you felt you had to be there in order to get that done, that was when you would be there. But if you showed up any later than, say, noon, hmm. you would probably get in trouble. So, I mean, I would usually get there at, like, 11 o'clock or 1030, and then work till, you know, whenever we were finished, which was usually midnight or 1.00. Um, and you know, and it was that way six days a week, Monday through Saturday, closed on Sunday. And then, you know, you would have, you know, whatever. It's just, that was the life. And it was, when I worked in Paris, it was the same thing, like, except it was even more brutal. Like we'd get there at eight o'clock in the morning, mm-hmm. work from eight until after lunch. And then if the kitchen was clean to the chef's satisfaction, then we would get what they would call a cooper or a break, you know, a slight break. And, um, if we did get a break, we, all the cooks would pile into the little cafe and smoke cigarettes until our faces turn blue and pound four espressos and then get back to the kitchen by like five o'clock to prepare that, for um you know dinner service that break being how uh, how long like and, uh, 45 minutes. minutes maybe an hour so you would re- sleep for 15 minutes if you could pound three or four espressos smoke seven eight, eight cigarettes and then and then get back to work and then they would let you go right before the last subway uh, <laughs> which would be like right right before midnight. Uh, yeah, that's wow. right. But wow. I, like I had a nightmare scenario. First week I worked there, all the whole, and I didn't speak very much French, a little bit like kitchen French. But they they kept telling us like they kept telling me beware the grand nettoyage. And I was like, what? what's a grand nettoyage? I didn't know what that meant. I mean, I knew it meant the big cleaning, but I didn't know what that all entailed. So Friday night comes around, closed on Saturday. Um, we do the regular cleanup. It's like midnight. I'm like, okay, guys, like take my apron off. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> would you forget about the grand nettoyage? And then we cleaned, you know, we proceeded to, you know, clean 
I mean, just moved everything away from the walls. The chef de cuisine was on his knees with a scrub brush on a wooden cutting board, like scrubbing the baseboards of the kitchen. And this is weekly? Weekly, every Friday. Oh, uh, wow. Mm. Every single thing. Oh, wow. Every take single the, thing. the uh, oven doors off the hinges yeah. and you scrub those yeah. too. Wow. And then, then they let us go and it was, you know, we finished, it was like 2.30, maybe 3 o'clock in the morning. I'm like, okay, I'm going to go to the subway. It was closed. Right. I'd, yeah, yeah, I'd never been to Paris before. I didn't know <laughs> that the subway closed at midnight. So I get there. It's like three o'clock in the morning. I'm in the seventh around these mom. My apartment is in the 18th. I'm like, I have no <laughs> idea what to yeah, do. Yeah, yeah. Right. I just started walking in the direction I <laughs> thought I should go and, and eventually made it home. You know, it was insane. But that was a weekly occurrence. Wow. And then Sundays, the restaurant was open. We, it was, Sunday was like a half day. We were only open for dinner. So we could go in at like 11 and finish at midnight. So, so just so people who aren't like super wow. food nerds like I am. So you would get there early. You, in France, you get there at 8 a.m. And you would you got to prep which means you're just chopping little vegetables and, mm -hmm. and making all of the stuff. For everything, the, yeah. Everything, right, for, in preparation for. And this, was it, were these restaurants, did they do a lunch service? Or was mm -hmm. this, so, yeah. so, so you're doing lunch and dinner. And, and real quick, saying you had a similar experience at, at, yeah. uh, at Robochon? It's, it's, yeah. The it's, same. Uh, it's yeah, just, well, that's the culture. Yeah, well, we, we opened uh, five days a week, lunch and dinner. Uh, closed uh, on the weekends. Okay. Right. Uh, but it was Monday through Friday, five days a week, roughly 14 hours a day. Um, I remember my first day, they told me to be there at nine. So I got there at eight thinking, I was like, ha, I will, I will show them how industrious I am. Yeah. And then everyone was already there <laughs> <laughs> having their cafe au lait and their croissant. And then looking at me like, where the hell have you been? <laughs> right. Yes. And then the, 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 the one, the one takeaway for me, the, the uh, sensory thing that it cannot get out is the smell of a gitan. Mm. Because it's not, it's the French cigarette. French cigarette. Yeah, it, yeah. it doesn't smell like any other cigarette. Right. It is, it's, it's, sharp, it's not right? a cigarette smell, it's a gitan smell. It smells like burning dirt. Okay. And I can't get it out. It's, it's a nice smell. Yeah. yeah. If someone's smoking it, I'll be like, ah, this is, this is yeah, the yeah. signature smell of <laughs> a French person's around. Of, of my teenager. <laughs> <laughs> so, what did you guys, actually, this is a good question. Did you guys get hazed for being Americans? Informally. Like, oh, look at these guys. Or, well, yeah, I, I remember I like American. So. But I remember like people. <laughs> well, you, I know you. Well, or, or or better or worse because you didn't look like an American. Like, were they like, oh, this guy's okay, or he's like, yeah, you probably had it even worse. Uh, well, I don't know how bad you had it. But <laughs> well, I mean, it's pretty. You <laughs> I don't know, think there's any a, of us had it good. <laughs> <laughs> but right. back then, I mean, there's a lot more like subtle or overt racism, mm. especially Very in overt. France. You know what I mean? And uh, the French? Oh, you don't say. <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, well, they probably thought they're, you're they're, Japanese or something, right? They like they kind of like the Japanese. Love the Japanese, right? Yeah. So we didn't we kind of cut you both ways a yeah, little bit. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, well, model minority yeah, by know. mistake. I don't know. I mean, look, just to be to put a fine point on it, there's an old, uh, I guess, I don't know, j jokes the wrong word, but like if you went to the average European in 1900 and you said, look, within 50 years, one nation in Europe will rise up and slaughter two thirds of the Jews on the continent, they'll say, oh, I can't believe the French would be so cruel. <laughs> You know, because that's that's sort of how the French. Well, they, are, well, they also had uh, like they were owned. They colonized most of the world at that point too. Uh, th right. You know, just they they With have the that wrapped for a reason, right. perhaps. You know, so oh, insulting everybody now. Yeah, hey, it's great. You know, okay, so we've got to bring it back a little bit to cars. Uh, and you know, this is an interesting one because I think I feel like you guys are have interesting. Um, your backs are, just, are so interesting, but let's talk about when you guys you're through the working for other people stage. You have launched your. Uh, your restaurants and you've had some success what was the splurge did you guys split what was the first big car automobile i don't you, you don't have to be car like what, what's what, okay watch. Car. what's the big car splurge what was the what was the <laughs> the like i'm gonna or maybe it hasn't happened yet i don't know what do you dream of i don't know i mean I, i'm pretty i'm pretty happy with the car i'm driving now which is uh, m550 okay Ooh, yeah, bmw nice m550 yeah okay i love it 518 horsepower yeah what color I'd, Black on black. Okay. okay. And you replaced essentially, you know, 545 was a Yeah, five, yeah 535. 535. So, yeah. always, oh, so you stepped it up. So 6 to V8. Always a BMW guy. Well, no. I mean, I, if I had my druthers, I, it'd be a 9, 911 turbo, but, you know. You know I, I feel like, I have, you, so what's stopping you, you know? You I know, but I have two kids in college and that's, uh, you know. That, yeah, that's that, their problem. Like, <laughs> no, I wouldn't. No. One, one of them's problem. at a pricey college. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. one of them's at a very pricey Yeah, one of them. <laughs> okay. Uh, Sang? I know you got a uh, you got. Well, Sang is, yeah, he's a, yeah. Sang does, so, not, have I, two I, I Sang should, does not have two kids in college. I should say, he does not, definitely does not have two kids in college. <laughs> but I should say, Sang calls me once every other week to ask about a car he's about to pull the trigger on. He's at the dealership. You called me from a test drive this week. 
I did. <laughs> but what, but what's the first split? So what's the first? Let, let's let, let's remember. level set here. What's the I'm first? I'm trying to remember splurge? what the what, what replaced a, the what IROC. Was a, what was a splurge? <laughs> what uh, what uh, replaced the IROC was a uh, GTI. Ah. Mark II GTI. Oh, nice. I love Mark II. Ninety three or yeah, ninety seven horsepower. Oh yeah, if that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, okay. I wasn't gonna. Motor Trend Car of the Year eighty five. Yes, I remember. Yes, yes, yes. I that was it. Gen one though, not Gen. No, Gen two. No, Gen t- no. It was Gen two. Oh, was it Gen two? Oh, it was Gen built two. in Pennsylvania. You're right. That's right. Uh, you're right. You're right. You're right. Import car. Import you're, car. No, no. It was like it was built in Pennsylvania. So it was oh, right, 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 right. Yeah, yes, yes, LG. you're right. That's yeah, right. You're right. I have the cover. Yes, that factory is probably why. What did you take your driver's license test in? The IROC. No, a Volvo station wagon. Oh, your mom, your mom's car. Uh, my dad's car. Your dad's car. Yeah, okay. one of my dad's cars. Yes, okay. it was a uh, yeah, a white '77 Volvo station wagon. I can't remember the model, but they all look the same. It was a one so it's a one four four. four. <laughs> when you took your test, it was a, what, almost oh, yeah. a fifty year old yeah, car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, yeah. Michael, what did, what did you? It's ran. a Volvo one four four for those. <laughs> what of did you take your? Um, 1973 Oldsmobile Omega oh. um, that I got from my grandmother Pistachio. Oh, nice. Your grandmother was named Pistachio? My grandmother's last name was Pistachio. <laughs> really? I swear to God. Really? <laughs> and the car was almost the color of Pistachio. That was really remarkable. The Omega remarkable. Pistachio. Old Omega. Wow. I was with okay. the Omega, yeah. Wow. Okay. So then you're split. So go back to saying, what was your... I, I don't... I'm trying to think. It's... it's uh, what was the... What okay, what's your, what's, your f- what's your first splurgy car? Well, that's what we're talking about. So, uh, well, like, let's, let's, well, we could try to uh, reverse engineer this. You took over <laughs> Father's Office, which was a dive bar you liked. It was in Santa Monica. I, I have fond memories of going there. This was this must have been 2003-ish? One or two. One? I feel like you guys are like the cops. Right yeah. Now. Yeah. <laughs> 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 They're actually the IRS. Yeah, you guys are just... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I what do you mean? I've never splurged on cars. <laughs> I don't know. But I'm just saying, I'm just trying to set it up because Father's Office was sort of this, the landmark um, gastropub in Santa Monica. Well, it was, but, but before it, that, it was actually a dive, dive. Like, yeah. It was a dive. It was great. Did it was, you put it was all the, the only ta- thing worth doing in Santa Monica. Did you put all the taps on the wall? Or was that the, was, no, the, uh, that was, it, was a, it was a beer bar. Right. Um, but it didn't have really food. and you know, so, um, Or lighting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or customers. <laughs> well, I was there. <laughs> like I said. Yeah. <laughs> Not reputable. But that, this was like 2002, right? It must have been. Uh, 2000. 2000. Yeah. You okay. got it over. 2000, yeah. All right. Jan- like literally the beginning of 2000. And did you instantly put in food or did that take a couple years? It took a couple, it took a couple months. Um, I had to kind of clean it up and um, we kind of operated as is. And then uh, there was the remnants of a kitchen because the previous owner had put in the taps but he attempted to do food, but never quite got there. So we kind of had to figure out if this is even feasible. I had no real business plan. It was just sort of this, um, hey, uh, do you want to buy this dive bar that you've been going to because they had good beer there? And um, I guess I I forgot, but I had put this bug in the owner's ear. I said, if you ever want to retire, let me know. And he did. And I, of course, had forgotten that I'd said that because it had been about five years. So I was on a beach in Spain on the only vacation I'd been on in I don't know how many years. And um, the, the, my, my Nokia cell, cell phone rings. <laughs> right. and, and then it's the owner of father's office and asked me if I wanted to talk about, uh, you know, assuming it. Hmm. So without much of a, you know, exit plan. I was like, okay, well, I'm here in like a fine dining restaurant. You know, do I want to really do this? Uh, and the sort of uh, uh, serendipity was I was had spent a couple weeks in Spain and I was only going to the, it was in Southern Spain. I've just been going to a lot of tapas bars. Right. And Father's Office reminded me of this sort of like Southern Spanish tapas place. It was like this, hmm. it, it, it felt like that's what it could be. Yeah. So I said, "Fine, I'll take it." Now so that on. was my first splurge. No, we can't we can't go any further because this is one of my favorite stories. But so you have a very notorious policy at Father's office. Well, you got this burger. That well, I've but had. not not just the burger. Yeah, right? yeah. The entire menu is no substitutions. Right. Right. I have. Yes. A, I wrote it down actually. Yeah. And and I, I bring this up because. Um, well, A, it's very notorious because, like, my wife, for instance, would love to try the burger one day, but she like detests blue cheese, and so she can never eat it. Um, you know, and I and I so that's you know not my problem. Right now, well, let's just be clear. And this so I love the policy. What? I love the policy I, for the record. The, yeah. the title of this of my briefing doc was it's called Hardcore Dudes because after I read I read about you guys, I'm like, man, these guys make some very like you guys are are very passionate about what you do uh, for different reasons. But let's uh, but and but saying in particular, the policies are. 
We do not permit any substitutions or modifications to any of our menu items, period. No ketchup at a place that serves a hamburger and fries. fries. No mustard either. No outside food or beverage with the additional stipulation, dessert items, including birthday cakes, are not permitted. (laughs) That was like. Which I was like, this is... This so, seems, does he want customers? So or the, no so, joy or happiness. So the or first time, so the first time I really hung out with saying it was me, you, and your your lovely girlfriend Jane. We went out to Parks Barbecue, which, by the way, uh, for everyone uh, in L.A., if you ever get a chance to go to Parks with Sang, it is like walking in with the, the like, you know, godfather of Koreatown. It was okay. – I was treated very different – like, you and I ate there once yeah. with Arash and treated very different. Right. <laughs> <laughs> <Let's>, <laughs> tables very, appear. Very, very different. Like, the A5 wasn't flying out of the back. You know what I mean? Right. Um, but I asked you about this, and you had a really lovely answer, and I'll be quick about it. You said, look, when I was at Michael's, people would come in and say, oh, I'm allergic to salt. Like, I don't want – no, no, no salt in my food. And so, you, if I ever opened up my own place, I'm just, I'm just going to have a no substitution policy. And I was, you know, I'm sitting there. I go, wow, that makes a lot of sense. And then Jane p- pipes up and goes, No, you're just an asshole. <laughs> 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 which, which I think both are true. <laughs> Comment. <laughs> I don't know. I think uh, you have. A, I mean. Michael Don't look a, to me, Bill. You out here, Sam. The man asked you a question. Well, Michael has a restaurant that you can only, you know, you can only have eight courses. What if I want four? Not, I mean, you know, I mean, it, you you, people don't mind my rules, but it, the reality is, I think we have very few rules because it's a very open. You know, you, you don't. You know, there's no reservations. Uh, you just come and go. You, you don't even have to eat. I, I always find that it's a very open platform. It's liberating. What I, what I like about it though is that you know it tends to weed out people that like don't like eating. You know, if you're if if uh, no seriously, because I, I I know a lot of people that I don't enjoy dining with that are like, oh, I don't want to go there because like I hate, you know, whatever, and uh, I I, I want to get a burger. You know, so I th- I think it's I I love it. I love it there. You know? What happens if I smuggle in ketchup? You can it, do whatever you it's want. It's happened. Yeah. No, okay. <laughs> it happens all the time. Yeah, it's, it's no, a it big thing. it happens all the time. It's not, it's not. <laughs> Literally, so, we see like red stains. All like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, people, I've seen it. People have ketchup packs. No, but like... I think at a certain point, you, um, I, I tell this to people all the time, is I don't, this is like a, I struggle with this, but <laughs> <laughs> like you don't serve, you don't, you're not in the food business. Like I'm not, the, the way I look at it is this, like, if you're in the food business, you're you, there's there's two ways of doing this. You can either be in the business of of providing caloric sustenance, or you can sell your opinion. And he, Michael is someone who sells his very strong point of view and puts it on a plate, you know. And that's why you're going there. You're not going there because you're hungry. It's you want to he- hear and experience what he has to say. Hmm. And I think that's the 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 difference is what you trade on. And I think I, I kind of figured out at an early age, like, um, yeah, no, this isn't food. It is food, but it's, it's well, expensive. Food. Right. And, you know, I'm, I mean, what I do is not, you know, inexpensive. It's, you know, it's not Providence prices. No. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, oh, let me tell you. <laughs> oh yeah. I, we're yeah. familiar. Yeah. But I, I, I really think that that's, you, you know, well, that, well, I that, think that, what that's you said, a difference. Put another way, you know, because you're famous, you're really famous for the Father's Office burger. But if you want another burger, if you want a burger where you can add and subtract whatever you like, make it your own, uh, you can go across the street. You can go to like three other places within walking distance in Santa Monica and get a burger that you could mess with as you like. But, yeah, he, but at here, no. Yeah, but if you're going to a restaurant, right. any, any, it doesn't matter. You're, you're going there because what they have to offer, and whether it's like a committee decided or, you know, an individual decided is like you like what they have to offer. Right. And you're going there to patronize this business because you like their opinion on something, whether it's well, in an yeah. app or Burger King, it doesn't matter. But if you just like, like I said, it's like a blank sheet of paper, just, hey, draw whatever you want on it. That's available too. That's just what I call caloric sustenance. You can right. go to a grocery store and assemble all the things. Sure. You want. Well, well, this is great because I, I did want to circle back to something you said, Michael, about your upbringing and how you got into the food business. And I think it does inform why a lot of people get into the food business. But maybe with saying I'm not so sure. Like, is it <laughs> ultimately? Is it about? That's on his tombstone, by the way. I'm not so sure. <laughs> is it about pleasing people? Like, did you like when you were? Growing up and experiencing, you know, Italian family dinners with the poker playing at the end, and then you're like, I, I want to do this for a living because I love, 
I like I'm a home cook. I like cooking for people. I like making them happy. Like, oh, look, look, look at this thing I made. I'm mm-hmm. so glad you're going to try it. Any of that motivate, like, inform the decision to get into uh, being a restaurant owner or no because it's fine dining and what Sang said and it's like I'm – I'm I'm telling a story here, or this is this is an experience I want to provide. Well, I mean, I think at the end of the day, it is about people's satisfaction and the level of their satisfaction. Like, you know, if you you know whether you're at um, Father's Office or a place like Providence, like you, the the most important thing is to meet or exceed your guests' expectations. And so, like, my goal every day when we wake up is to try to figure out how to do that, how to do it better than we did yesterday, and um, you know, and achieve whatever it is the goals that I have for the place. You know. Um, uh, did I get into it in the first place to please people? I think that's certainly part of it. And I also feel like I, I was drawn to just do something with my hands. And mm. at the end of the day, food is a craft, but I think before it's an art. And um, that's just my opinion. A lot of people would say it's the other. Uh, it's the other way around. It's art, more art than craft. In my opinion, it's more craft than art. Certainly the way I approach it. Like it's about how, you know, about taking, you know, the very best ingredients that we can find and figuring out a way to you know, create a, a dish that's like harmonious and delicious and visually beautiful and uh, is satisfying on some level. Um, and so I, and I think that there's a real craft to that. Um, uh, I mean, I don't know, that's just kind of where I'm at. But I think at the end of the day, like, doesn't matter, like I said, it could be Father's Office and a burger, it could be Providence and a multi-course meal. But at the end of the day, if you walk out the door and you're like, not happy with the the, the um, experience versus the value uh, versus the price, like you, you know, you're not going to go back. So my goal is to create a place where people come in, and even though it is it, it is an expensive experience, it's something that they're like, well, that was it was money well spent, you know. And I, I think in the car world, it's the same thing. It's right. like you know, like you don't go into a Kia dealership li- having the same expectations you do if you walk into a Porsche dealership or a Rolls Royce dealership or something like that. Right. They're just two completely different. Um, two completely different expectations there. Um, you know, at the end of the day, it's my responsibility, just like it's any manufacturer's responsibility to make sure that whatever that experience you were looking for, that you you get it in whatever the product is that you purchased. Right. I have a question for Ed. Why would you call Michael hardcore? Because we figured out, we know about Sang, but what, what was it about his, when you were uh, well, doing your so creepy prov- research? Well, so Providence... <laughs> Providence is, uh, again, number one. You don't get to number one on on uh, Jonathan Gold's list or two Michelin stars for, for not having, like, a lot of, like, a disciplined approach. And everything about Providence is about the freshest, the best seafood, like, which alone is limiting to a lot. Of, like, my wife does not, like, doesn't eat seafood. Like, it's, what? Uh, she, she does, but it's, like, it's 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 not everything. It's, her, her palate is not as broad as mine. Ooh. So... And then you have a you have a mission uh, to get after sustainable seafood. Mm-hmm. So like these are not like you could just make seafood. You could just go make seafood, right? You could just do it. You, there, there are easier ways. There there are less expensive ways. Actually, we should talk about it. that. Could you could you talk to us about the Providence? Well, not just Providence. Your other restaurant, Connie and Ted, just like you're you're huge on sustainability. Like if mm-hmm. you if you look at your Instagram account, it's what you talk about like constantly. Mm-hmm. Um, just like give us the two minute version of why this matters. No, I mean, it matters to all of us. Like, you know, it, to me, it's a, it's a there's an overarching, obviously, concern that the whole entire world is facing, which is climate change, which affects every single industry, period. <clears throat> um, you know, sustainability, from my point of view, when it comes to fish and seafood, it's something that we either take an interest in it or in a couple of generations, there will be no more wild seafood. And to me, that's a terrible shame. And it's the kind of, like, to me, it's no different than, like, if you care about their, the fact that there might not be another blue whale, um, somewhere swimming around in this in this world, um, then you should care about whether or not there's another bluefin tuna or whether or not there's another yellowtail or striped bass on the East Coast or whatever it is. You right. know, these things are all important. Just the same way it's important that we say, you know, invest every ounce of energy that we can and resources into saving the rainforest because it's in our collective best interest. Right. It's, it's the also the planet. Yeah. yeah, it's also in our collective best interest to do everything we can to make sure that we pass on the future generations uh, sea that is full of sustainable seafood for many reasons. Like, not the least of which being like, for instance, if you don't take all the muscle shoals uh, out of estuaries in the Gulf Coast and places like that, you don't have to ar- have the Army Corps of Engineers spending billions of dollars to protect New Orleans. You know, there were natural barriers against that, ha- what the, against what happened down there. And it was it was there for eons, but we took it all away. So there are incredible lessons we learned in trying to keep our oceans and our planet, obviously, sustainable. And to me, I feel like with every dollar that we spend, I feel like we have a responsibility to try and make good uh, choices that um, that reflect that idea. 
you know. Um, and we don't preach about it in the restaurant. Um, I definitely talk to the staff about it. So if we have guests that are interested, they will know uh, the reasons why we do what we do. But it's it's an important thing. And it's also, to me, it was really eye-opening, having, especially having grown up, you know, in, in Thousand Oaks, which is really close to the Channel Islands. And I spent a lot of time as a kid boating around the Channel Islands and, and stuff like that. Like, I never had seafood that, from around there. It just wasn't a thing. You know, I'm mm-hmm. sure I'm sure every piece of shrimp I ate came in from Thailand or wherever. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm sure all the, the, the fish came in from South America or whatever. But, like, you know, I start, when I really started eating at Providence a lot, and I'm lucky enough that, you know, I know you so I get to do that. But it's like, oh, yeah, here's, um, you know, shrimp from Santa Barbara. It's mm-hmm. like, it's delicious. Uni, rockfish yeah, from uni, Santa Barbara. Yeah, everything. Uni, everything right. You know, and it's yeah. like. That's probably I, new move, that localism, like eat, eat local. But it's of, also yeah. delicious. It's not, sure. it's not that you're, you're not compromising anything. No. Other and you're than, putting money back into the local economy. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You know, but, the whole thing. Supply chain. Yeah. You're not, and you're then, not flying. And you're not, it over yeah. You're not flying or, or shipping or whatever. You know, and Which, also. By the way, we do that too, but, you know. Yeah. Right. But, the, but I mean, the but, way. But, the way you know, people, life's a chess game. Right. Yeah, people yeah. talk about that all the time about carbon footprint or the ingredients that places like I use or places like uh, Sang uses or ingredients that Sang uses. But the truth is, like, most food is flown on commercial airliners in their freight holds. Mm. Um, and so those planes are already in the air. And that that's the. You know, I mean, Fair whatever. Point. It's a justification, Fair but that's point. how I look at it. Okay. See, that's why it's so hardcore. Right. Yeah. Oh no, I get uh, it. Well, let's let's. let's so I, and I appreciate uh, Michael trying to guide the discussion back to cars, which is like probably on the minds of like half of the people listening. Like, when are you guys going to start talking about cars? So we right. never got out of your. <laughs> yeah, like, that's right. Now, okay. So, how about just asking, what do you currently own? <laughs> well, here's the thing. I read a New York Times interview. I read a New York Times interview you did, uh, 2010. Oh, and what a good uh, in interview. it, in I it, was seven. Then. Yeah. In okay. it, no, in it, you talk about an Audi. Uh, you were lusting after an Audi R8 V10. R8 V10. But you also mentioned, this is, and I had a surprise for you. Uh, you also mentioned that one of your favorite, uh, whatever, distributors, food distributors is a Bacalones. It's a different Sangyun? <laughs> no, no, no. It's in, it's in the... Uh, it's well, in... I, I wrote down some quotes from that. So you said, you said uh, as for gifts, uh, I'm not that close to anyone. Oh. <laughs> which I was like, that yeah, oh. makes sense. Okay. Uh, also helpful, uh, which your favorite beat? And you said, uh, I hate sand, which... <laughs> Does this ring a bell at all? No? Maybe. Maybe. The okay. New York Times. It's a small little paper. <laughs> right. You know. yeah. Anyway, so, okay, so fine. What, what car, what car what, what's on your, like... Um, uh, like must have you're super interested in now or, yeah or or one you sold and you regret no no all three what was what was your first splurge what are you driving now and what 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 do you what I'm do you remember regret? what my first splurge was it was so um what was my first splurge? Right, maybe, maybe forget maybe this maybe question. like an M6 Okay, that's yeah. pretty pretty splurgy. That was splurgy, yeah. Okay, uh, and then and you had you did have a Tesla, right? At one point, you had I did a Model have a Tesla S. in twenty fourteen. Yeah, I well, tried early that. adopter, yeah. early adopter. Yeah. Uh, P eighty P eighty five. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Did you like it? It's okay. Okay. Um, what, what? Why was it just okay? Just so our listeners know. Well, I I I thought well, what a it's a complete paradigm shift. You don't, you know, you, you completely, your, your routine is completely disrupted by it, which is cool. Um, I just thought it was like a crappy car, like mm. as a car. Like, I like the fact you plugged it in. I like, you know, like, where, that were, you, was cool. where were you charging it? At my house. Okay. Um, it wasn't, there was no inconvenience to it. It just, um, this was many years ago. So right. like the charging network was like exactly. zero basically. Right. Yeah. Um, I, I got the range anxiety thing one time I drove to Orange County like 150 miles stated, and then um, it was a 45 mile each way, and I, it it almost didn't make it. it right, it right, was, right. Yeah, it was. Yeah, I barely got to the Culver City Supercharger with like you know, one mile on it. It was it was <laughs> right. yeah it was stressful. Like full sphincter clinch sweat. <laughs> okay, just. <laughs> Oh yeah, for my yeah, I've yeah. done. I've had that happen, and I've, I've, I've had that happen in gas cars too, though. It's, I mean, you know that they can come and bring you gas right, for some yeah. reason. You think that there's no way to get a if it dies, that's it. I have to yeah, walk away. Yeah, I thought away. it was dead. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And I was reading on some forums that you can brick it, like if you go to zero. Uh, right. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Not totally Whatever. true, but, but yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But but that's out there. It's out there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So. Yeah, I was really, really nervous. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I I said to myself, I will have another electric car. This is just not in the moment, but I had my, you know, experience, experience. with it. How long did you have it? Three years. I just okay. leased it because, you know, okay. it's, it's like a, I thought you were buying a piece of technology. I don't want to own this. Right. It's like, it's like a phone. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, I don't want to. Okay. Yeah, I thought that's ridiculous, but I'll borrow it for three years. And, yeah, it was obviously not my only car at the time because I thought, oh, that's the other thing is, I don't know if you can have it as your only car. I mean, you could, but what are the compromises you're making if you said, well... But you're also uh, a pretty serious car collector. I mean... I don't know. I have a few cars. But yeah. the thing about... Okay. 
You know what I thought about? Okay, when I think of cars, my first the first word that comes to my head is, is freedom. And to me, the Tesla didn't. It felt like you were tethered. Right. Like you you couldn't actually be free. Right. Uh, you, you just couldn't like, hey, I'm just gonna go somewhere and then sure. like not think about it. And I thought that to me is like this mental leash that this car has, and it has to. Right. I think that's. I think a lot of people feel that. Like. It's... Yeah, for, for definitely. But you know, it's I. I the way I'm looking at it, you know, I, I just got an EV, and so the way I'm looking at it more and more is like, you're free, but you, it it does require a little bit of planning. Yeah. And um, we have this American notion of like, I'm not going to think. <laughs> I'm just going to go. <laughs> Spon- spontaneity. I have a maybe. credit card. <laughs> I'll deal with everything later. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna burn gas, which well, we I know do. changes the climate. But I'll I'll deal with it later. You it's know, combined so. with I want it now. Yeah, so it's not so really. I can't it's, wait. I'm not gonna not wait thirty minutes. Freedom. Right. It's just like ignoring uh, immediate consequences. So, but I know what you mean. I know what you mean. So, yeah, so, and, and again, like, how often are you really going on crazy road trips where you have to worry about it? No, like, not yeah, often. Yeah. I, can, you know, I, I get it. Yeah, I, yeah. I'm, there's an EV I want right now. <laughs> Which one? I would like a Hyundai Ionic. Ah, Johnny, Ionic Five. Ionic Five. Yeah, Ionic Five. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Ionic 5, we, yeah. We or the yep. new one that's supposed to be coming out, the N model. Yes, the Ionic yes. Six and that, that. Not the six. Not the six. Five. Oh, the, like oh, the version. One. Oh, you like? Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, Johnny I, will, uh, of Ionic Five in. This. I will. He'll be um, useful in some fashion. I also heard. I guess this is breaking news, which I know this is not going to come out for a while. But there is a, a Kia EV6, which is the platform mate of the Ionic Five. There's a GT version, which is uh, someone I know drove it and just said like, "That's it, game over." Kia wins. This hmm. is the car. How See? much? How much so, do you lean into your uh, your Korean heritage? Because we can make that happen. <laughs> I mean, I'll lean as hard as you need to. Okay. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> what, what, whatever it takes. Yeah. Whatever. <laughs> so, do I need to take someone to parks? <laughs> no, we, uh, we, yes. Me. I, I'll do it. Yeah. We know, we know you some, get me the car, park. So yeah. We're done. We yeah. know some people. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I'm not paying 8K over. <laughs> yeah. No, okay. no. That, that, that those times that. might be over. I think we're starting to see a little. Well, yeah, Ionic 5 is very hard to get. but uh, They're everywhere, though. Yes. Mm. They've taken over LA. But if you know Johnny Lieberman and you take him to parks. Yes. And you're, you can I can lean into my Korean so, heritage, <laughs> like or, if I need to pose for with it or something, or you know do an ad or right say something nice about it, I will. Okay, okay. Good. Completely... noted, noted. Yeah. We have yeah. that on record. Yeah. So Michael, I'm a shill. I'll do anything. <laughs> <laughs> are you? Are you? Look, you have a you have a, a passion for sustainability for in your restaurant in your line of work. Are you? But looking... you drive a 500 horsepower V8. Yes. Are you looking? Is EV on the radar? Yes. Are you looking at something? My wife's next car. Okay. The Good. Volvo. I like the Volvo. The recharge. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And she it. has a she XC has a Volvo ninety now. now. Yeah. 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 Oh. Former, oh. former SUV of the year. Uh, the plug-in hybrid or just a regular? No, a regular. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, is this something you guys consider? When you open your restaurants, are you putting in EV chargers in the parking lot, or is this anything? Do you guys even look at that? Or are you like, nah? The only place I ever saw that was What's uh, a parking uh, lot. The, <laughs> <laughs> the French guys... Laundry has one, and they have two um, E7 or the BMW 7 Series electric. Uh, that they they have their, a, their shuttles or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Oh, to they take do. you around. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what the range is. I don't know how far uh, they will like, take you. It's like twenty eight. No, miles. I mean, yeah. I'm saying I don't know how far the they. They will take you in the car. Oh, oh the range of their service. Yes. 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 But yes. they have two of them and two beautiful charging stations. And um, they're just sat there for anybody that oh, wants that's, to use them. That's, that's kind uh, of a good flex. To know. Oh, right? yeah. it, oh, it's absolutely a flex. But, but that Thomas, whole restaurant's a flex. Yeah, Thomas Keller's a king of flex. <laughs> yeah. Okay. If you and work a little harder so. and get that third star, maybe you too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> on your own fleet of BMW. And we do have a parking yes. lot. So just, you know. Do you? <clears throat> I've always, I, I thought it was valet. No, we have a big parking lot. I had no idea. Yeah. Hi, it's developable. Uh, you can develop on it too, is just for anybody that's out there looking for <laughs> property in Hollywood. Ooh, interesting, I had no idea. Yeah. <laughs> so Why didn't you open with that? Father's office in next door. Well, look, I, this is funny. It's funny to me that you call that out at uh, French Laundry is arguably you know, one of the most famous iconic restaurants. Thomas Keller, you know, like a god amongst you know food nerds, that you recognize that him having. Two electric vehicle chargers and two EVs, ostensibly, yeah, is a flex. What else is a flex? flex? What else, when you go out or you when you oh, go, go out yeah, yeah. to a restaurant or somebody opens a new uh, new restaurant somewhere and you stick your head and you're like, oh, dang, he got the – or they got the fill in the blank. What do you – is it? Is it the wine list? Is it a chandelier yeah. or something? The or wine what? list has a lot to do with – I mean, to me, it, you know, obviously you, the place should look nice and feel well-kept and all that kind of stuff. But, like, to me, uh, what – 
what I'm impressed with is like, you know, the quality of the ingredients and the quality of everything you, you know, that you touch when you go to a restaurant, the tables, the linens, the silver, the glassware, the, the China, like all that stuff to me is like, and, you know, I don't know. I think, and I think also this relates so, you know, um, there's a very clean line, I think, between the, what this discussion and cars, you know, because to me, I think chefs, especially like, you know, chefs like yourself saying, or, or like me or anybody that is, you know, aspirational and wants to cook really, really good food. I think one thing that we share in common is an appreciation for design, I think. For and, sure. And an yeah. eye for the aesthetic, I think. And, and I mean, to me, that's what I appreciate most about cars. Like when you see a new, whatever it is, and it doesn't have to be an incredible, uh, you know, incredibly expensive car, but like, for oh, instance, like the whole design. new line of Kias that have come out under this new guy's direction, I think they're like some of the coolest looking cars right. that, that are on the road right now. Right. And they're not expensive, but the design is great, you know. Um, I, I, I would say real quick, I mean, it's funny you said that because I... Both of your restaurants, and I, I've obviously been to a lot of different restaurants, but, like, I remember from Luke Sean, I remember, like, the, the plates really well. They were distinctive, you know, and, like, same at Providence, obviously. I know you guys go all kinds of crazy different plates, but yeah. it, it's, it does stand out. You yeah, know, not only the food, but it's like, oh, that's, like, I remember that that crazy um, uh, Myanmar salad. Uh, what was it? Um, oh, the tea leaf salad. The tea yeah. leaf salad, which it's just, like, probably the best salad I've ever eaten, but I remember the plate it was on was, like, really good cool as well you know well to michael's point too you you were saying that it doesn't it's not about the price necessarily and that's why it was interesting because when you said i got an ev i'm looking at and i was like oh he's gonna say tycon or he's gonna say something like on that upper end or there's a there's a new aston ev coming out or whatever but you said you think you know me yet I, <laughs> you said <laughs> ionic Shang 5 is all over the place on cars which I is gotta, which is say. a very design driven vehicle but i get i get calls from saying like hey New SL63 or, uh, hey, new Metris or, hey, you know, like you're everywhere with cars. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. You don't know me. (laughs) (laughs) I don't. I'm trying. I'm trying. (laughs) Shanna. Trying to well, what, <laughs> so but what's so uh, how about for you though what's what's the fle- what's a what's an identifiable flex that we should like if you walk in you're like oh man i really like uh, is there a name like uh, you mentioned like oh a certain linen or uh, like if i pick up a fork and i go oh that's, that's no i'm just i don't know no what? i appreciate detail i mean we're into you know cars watches we like we love you know i love detail i love you know i, I love you know something someone paid attention to something that most people would never pay attention to. I'm, I'm very appreciative of, of that kind of thing, um, uh, which is probably why I like watches because, you know, there's they're like little That's what it's all about. Machines, L- yeah. Yeah, little sparkles. People and... care about things you can't even see. Right, and right. And I, 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 lo- I, love, I love detail. I, I think I know you do too, but um, like in, in, at Father's Office, one thing that like – some of the some of the, my coolest things I think I do are invisible. And co- going back to sustainability is like, um, well, the Culver City location is all solar. That's interesting. That's I didn't do that, but I, I kind of like that. And also, I've been big on reducing the use of chemicals uh, in wear washing, sanitizers, and things like that, where I'm trying to remove as many chemicals as possible. Hmm. Um, because wa- keeping a restaurant clean is very chemical intensive. Mm. It just it takes all you have to pay. You have to you know, we we get a giant chemical bill every every week, and uh, the idea is to try to minimize it, uh, use a, a much lower environmentally impactful um, clean, cleaning solutions, and using things like um, high pH water in lieu of sanitize chemical huh. sanitizers. So I'm big on trying to sort of clean up the restaurant of the cleaning products, if you will. Right. No, that makes sense. I think that's important. But it's interesting. You know, this is real quick, just going back to like when you walk into a place, like like um, there's that wonderful place down the street you, you hit me to, Pizzeria Say, which I know yeah. I've eaten at oh, we oh, went yeah. together 7,000 times yeah, because it's, it's a mile from the studio. No, I paid No, too. I paid. <laughs> <laughs> you dropped like a couple quarters on the floor <laughs> when you left, but no, I paid. <laughs> Just we have to keep scoring. This Absolutely thing. false, just yeah. so everyone knows. But Johnny owes me lunch. it was interesting because I eat it and I'm like, this is delicious. And I was I was like watching you eat it and you know, you were kind of didn't say anything, didn't say anything. And then your first comment was, You can tell this guy has a fine dining background. Like that, you know, and I was like, Well, what do you mean? And you're like, Well, the, the details of like where the salt's going on and like the you know, how thin the potato was sliced and the, no right. no you can tell yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. we well, worked at providence i got you. yeah well yeah, the, yeah. Be- the best part is that so i charge you so much yeah. I-, I ate there yesterday <laughs> by the way no <laughs> it wasn't that expensive the best oh. it's really cheap <laughs> the best part is he you're talking about having a your your parks barbecue moment yeah uh, i was saying yeah i had 
a similar experience with you because you were dropping his name. Oh, totally. <laughs> like he's like, you know, you, you know, Johnny introduced uh, himself to the chef and mentioned that, uh, oh, I heard you worked at Providence and I'm a good buddy with Michael Samarusti. Next thing you know, we get the uh, the pickled vegetables showed up like we didn't order and we got an extra pizza thrown onto our, onto yeah. our tab. And Sa- it was- same thing happened uh, with <laughs> Russell yesterday. <laughs> but he, he did recognize me. He okay. was like, oh, hey, good to see you again. Well, and you've then, been known several times now. I, and I, that's, mean, I, I think constantly. that's the mark of a good restaurateur too. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, but and I think also like the through line here with everything you were just talking about. What we're, I mean, except for the chemical bit, but what you're talking about, what makes, what distinguishes Pizzeria SA from the other places you've been to is craft. You know what yeah. I mean? It's like craft, yeah, and, yeah. and that those details come right back to cars as well. You know, sure. you're like someone in a design studio somewhere that just has a different line about, you know, a, a different idea about where a line should fall on a car or where a contour should fall. And you know, these are, you know, whether they take those cues from the natural world as we do, like when we're cooking with ingredients and that sort of thing, or whether they, you know, they just pull it, I don't know, somewhere out of the ether. But it's those decisions that, you know, that make, you know, a, the final product, whether it's a dish that you're eating. Um, you know, during the course of a, a wonderful dinner or whether it's, you know, the final product rolling off an assembly line uh, somewhere. You know, it was someone that took the time to calculate all of that. Yeah. Someone no, that evaluated it all. Yeah, and, it, and it's huge. And, and there's, there's ways to do it very poorly. You know, and there's ways to do fine dining very poorly. I've been yeah. to a number of those. But, like, you know, like... Well. Caloric, it's a caloric sustenance, right? Or, yeah. or, or are you going to experience the opinion of a car designer? And but I, I've been to places right? where it's just expensive. There's, it's right. just, that's, right, right. that's the whole point. It's like Miami. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> it's expensive and full volume while you you're eating. It. Yeah. You love it. You love but um, it. no, but like, like Lucid, for instance, uh, you know, they, they're very California centric. Derek Jenkins, the head of design, he's been a guest on here, but like, you know, it's from California, very proud of it. And so their interiors are like this, you know, it's called Santa Monica, but specifically what it is, is it's w- the colors you see in Santa Monica at 5.01 a.m. That's the mm-hmm. color palette. Or they have Santa Cruz at like 7 p.m. And the, you know, it's, it's also a time of year. They, I forget what it is. But they actually, the, the woman who came up with all these, um, she went to these places and she stood there and took photos and videotaped and brought it all back and they blew it up and they watched it. And that's where the design palette comes from. And I think it's brilliant, you know, like why not? Mm-hmm. And, and it is terrific design. Tells a story. Tells a, tells a story and, and an interesting story. There's, a, there's so. a great documentary about one of my – Absolute heroes of a chef whose name is Michel Bra. Ooh, the, love him. Yeah, Almost three, worked for him. Yeah, three oh. Michelin star in La Guiole, France. And he, you know, in this video, TV Sang follows him and he's standing out on a plane and he just has a pane of glass on a tripod that's just sort of sitting there and he's tracing the lines of the, the hills in the you know, far off. Oh, um, I love that scene. We, you know, and he's pay, like, he's also <laughs> tracing clouds and things like that. And then he took that back to his kitchen and he said, this, I want to put this on a plate. So it's the yeah. same idea what yeah, you're talking yeah. about with right, Lucid. Right, it's like right. capturing a moment, capturing a feeling, capturing a color palette. And I feel like, you know, there is, a, again, this is another connection between food and auto design, I think, or any kind of great design, design, really. Great right. design, yeah, 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 yeah. It's, yeah. Very interesting. All right. Well, we could talk. I could keep going. We could go for hours. Yeah. But we just got the high sign. And, yeah, uh, yeah. And so we'll have to have you back. Yeah, um, definitely. You know, maybe when you're a little older, saying, you know. <laughs> <laughs> when you can drink. More worldly. <laughs> More worldly. Uh, I did want to end on one question, um, mm. and this is this should be fun for everybody, uh, especially people who live in L.A. Uh, best sushi in Los Angeles. Go. <laughs> you go first. Uh, go to every day. Like, it's a it's a Tuesday night. You just want somewhere to go. Sushi Gen. Okay. Uh, in uh, Honda Plaza, I think very it is, so, downtown. Yeah, very yeah. solid. That's, yeah, solid. Very very solid. That's a good yeah. one. Um, I like it. Um, and then if I you do, if that. the Well, it's I'm not gonna, best. Two, if sky's the limit, I'm going to give you three. Nice. Um, <laughs> Hayato, which is not, it's more omakase. Not it's not just sushi. Okay. No, it's not. Yeah, it's, but okay, Japanese yeah. experience. Omakase, yes, omakase is omakase. fine. Omakase. Yes, um, inclusive of. Or really kaiseki is more yep. what it's like, I guess. Um, so that, uh, Ginza Sushi Onodera. Um, good. Yeah. No, wait, no, no. Yeah. No, what's it do called you, now? Do you mean Mori? No, mo- yeah, Mori. Oh, Mori, and then the other Mori one. Hero. No, the other one. Our friend Mori? Yes, our yeah. friend Mori. And Atwater. He's yes, in Atwater. And, Atwater. and yeah. then the other one, though. On, um, Ginza Onodera. No. No, and that's the one. The one on La Cienega? You're going to have to cut that out. No, it's the one. Uh, <laughs> no, we'll leave it in. The, the guy on, uh, on um, Can- uh, Rodeo Drive. He's not there anymore. He's not? Wait, are you talking about uh, Urusawa? Urusawa. Yeah. Is it still there? I think so. Oh, that's funny. Say Urusawa. That name goes way back. Yeah. I know, but I thought he. 
Okay. I don't know. Yes, if it's still there. If it's still there. I yeah. mean, it's an, it's an incredible experience. Yes. It's where Masa got his start. Yes. Masa yes, from, yes, yes, yes. Uh, from, the, the, from New York now. Now he's from awesome. New York. You know, bring your wallet. Yeah, yes. bring, yeah, yeah. but you bring know. Bring someone else's wallet. Or again, more a hero. Bring, but if you want to appreciate Bring Sang's craft, wallet. If you want to appreciate craft. Oh, yeah, absolutely. This yes. is, that's one of the it's, best yeah. places to do it. Okay. Yeah. Any of those places. Sang, okay. same question. Um... Mori, yeah. Well, he's, he used to be called Mori Sushi. Now I think it's called Mori Hero. It's in Atwater. Yeah. You know, he's a friend of many of us, and uh, um, he's extremely. You see this thing? He's extremely opinionated. Uh, he he's not a very forgiving. You know, he's 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 really rigid in his beliefs. And I think you know, like him, like you know, like there's a, a kind of like the people who are like that. Like you want to hear what they have to say, and you want to know what they're up to. And I think that's what you're paying for. So. Um, sushi can be quite expensive. Very, very expensive. Uh, I just yeah. ate it, uh, Morihiro. It's, uh... Oh, yeah. Oh, and yeah, yeah. but people Woo! ask, is it worth it? And I was like, Woo! okay, well, if you don't care, it's right. not worth sure, it. Sure, yeah, sure, Yeah, but if you are um, interested in the attentiveness to these little teeny, teeny details, and with sushi, it is just m- tiny details yeah. that... The temperature that can, of the rice. That can make, you know, make everything different um but if you don't care about those things just go to the grocery store yeah <laughs> if you want fish T- and rice you can get it anywhere tastes great yeah no i like maury um there's a place in um on uh, beverly west hollywood here called um, um matsumoto i think is solid sushi again downtown very solid um what i like about that guy is it, it's like a absolute factory it's just packed and busy all the time but i've seen him buy fish and he doesn't compromise. Mm-hmm. And I thought, wow, mad respect to a guy who doesn't need to buy the better version, but he is anyway. Right. And I, you know, and we can, you know, <clears throat> we, have, we can go behind the curtain and see what people buy. And sometimes I see people, you're like, oh, I can't believe he's buying the frozen blank. Right. Despite charging these prices. <laughs> right, right. right. But I was impressed by Sushi again. I was like, you know, I've seen him like send back the tuna because it's not to a standard. It's like, wow. <laughs> also, he, he used to. He t- Great little guy. Used to drive a Hummer H3. Used to see him all the time in the fish market. In it. And then he switched to a Mini Cooper. Oh, nice. <laughs> all right. Whatever. Very funny. I actually have one last question. So my, this is for Michael, though. So yes. this guy always, no matter what, every single time, puts ice cubes in bourbon, including his own single barrel picks, no matter what. I brought him, I brought him like a Smooth Ambler Old Scout as a present, puts an ice cube in it, and is like in my face about it. Should we just stop being friends? Please. <laughs> I didn't I didn't know this about you before, before I agreed to do this. Um, See? I'm coming to the province tonight See? ordering ice. Reconsider everything. I'll have the bullet with the ice. Crushed ice. If you, and if, 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 and whipped cream. If you order the willet, you can have ice. I'll give you ice. <laughs> well, awesome. on that note. On that note. It was awesome to have you guys. Uh, yeah, it was really we'll, fun. We'll bring you back uh, again when you're older and wiser and more mature. But uh, this was awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. My pleasure. All right. Sang you, Michael Rusty. It was awesome.